going to do my best. So we are going to have to follow the outline for sure. I am sharing my screen, correct? Not with the actual audience, but let me get on Zoom. So I am going to um, open to share my screen right away. And if one of you who is online can please confirm that you can hear me and that then that you'll be able to see my screen, that would be great. Anyone who's online yet confirm you can hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay, great. Hi, Callie. Thanks for um, saying yes. Joe's gonna manage the comment section for us today as well. Just so you know, we will not have a ton of time for questions because there is a lot of information in here, but the it, this is a four part series on giving you all sorts of information about the components of a home, uh, talking points, how to recognize certain repairs that are required. Hi, Colin. Hi, um, hi Kelly. How to uh, be able to communicate on a different level about finishes that go into a home. So if you are talking with clients while you're on a showing, how do you recognize what really is just kind of a low level upgrade versus what is a higher end finish? And there is a lot of information in here. I basically tried to download my brain into an outline when it comes to interior finishes. I have probably missed a few things. I will make this available electronically to the entire team. I just wanted to go through the training first. And hopefully you can put it to good use. What I would really love from you guys is feedback afterwards if you learned even one thing that was helpful today, okay? And I'm also gonna try not to lose my voice because I have excessive talking to do. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen and then let's see if you guys can see everything. It is recorded. Yep. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. Hi, Trevor. Thanks for joining. Andy, is that would you do me a favor? I think this is my last one. Trust issues. I'm grabbing water. I want to make sure I didn't grab somebody else's. Okay. Welcome to residential homes part one. Today we're gonna to go over the nine most oh nuggets here. Hi, baby girl. <laughs> Actually beautiful brought her baby in today, and I just love her. She's a sweet pig. So this ran a baby. Her baby. I said her baby. Uh, yes. Uh, if you're sitting in a seat, you should all have a copy of the outline or the packet. If you are online, please come into the office at some point. The samples are going to stay here just so everybody has access to them. Um, I'm going to turn one wall here into kind of a mini training center if I can. Okay, so if you see the outline, welcome to Residential Homes Part 1, Architectural Styles, Interior Finishes. We're going to discuss the nine most common style of home in Minnesota. No, this is not going to be every single home that you see. I had to consolidate this, not to every single finish that's available or in existence, but what are we most commonly seeing when we are touring properties. So let's dive right in. Okay, so nine most common styles. First, the first style is a ranch style home. Most people think this is any single level home. That is not true. My internet connection is unstable. Well, that sucks. I hope there's not a disruption to you guys and you can hear okay. A ranch style home. So it is a single story home. It's a long kind of low ground hugging profile. It's known for its open floor plans and minimal minimalistic interior, oftentimes has large windows. Um, I think a classic element of that, which isn't on here, is like a bay window or a bow window that you would find in the front of a home. A bay window has angles to it. Bow window literally looks like a bow and arrow. It's a window that kind of goes on a curve. We'll talk more about windows in two weeks when we get into exterior updates and finishes. Um, attached garages are also a common theme. So you're gonna kind of notice that here. The easy way for agents to identify this is because of their sprawling layout and simplicity, right? So this is really common right now. Uh, well, actually it's pretty common in a lot of the initial outskirt suburbs of Minneapolis. So we see in, in Minneapolis, when that era of home was being built, they all kind of follow the same theme. And then as the city has expanded out from uh, into the suburbs, each of those communities is a representation of the style of home that was common at the time that those communities were developing. 
So we start to see more ranch style homes as we spread out from the um, center of Minneapolis and St. Paul. This is gonna be a more common style home that you're gonna see in Minnetonka, Chanhassen, uh, Bloomington has a lot of ranch style homes. Burnsville has a lot of ranch style homes. Egan has ranch style homes. Invergrove Heights, a lot of ranch style homes. Maplewood and Roseville have a lot of ranch style homes. So just some communi uh, communities where you will be able to recognize that. Um, Craftsman Bungalow. If you have showed homes in Minneapolis, you know exactly what style home this is. It is one of my absolute favorites. It's known for its low pitched roof lines, gabled or hipped. We will talk about those different roof styles in a couple weeks. Um, wide overhanging eaves, that's what this is here, right? Like this edge line of a house is an eave. So typically they are at least 24 inches, which means that you're getting a two foot eave that hangs over the edge of the house. That's great for protection on windows, just so you know. So if you've seen a stucco home before where it just literally drops down, that water runs straight down the house. When you have a craftsman style home like this, you're getting this big eave that is an added level of protection over the window. And it's also an architectural element. Handcrafted stone and woodwork are uh, really common with these. In Minnesota, believe it or not, this is a picture of a house in Minnesota, but in Minnesota, it, it was super common to close off the front porch, right? So with this era of home, they're built all over the country, but here, because weather and winter, it's very common to see this style porch enclosed, right? Who has shown a house in Minneapolis that's been in a craftsman? Lots of exposed woodwork, wide open arches, custom windows, and then these um, kind of dormers that kick out are very common as well. Agents are recognizing them by the detailed woodwork, cozy yet kind of artistic appearance. Victorian style homes. I love these too. Deeply pitched rooms, pointed arches, ornate detailing and vibrant colors. If you have shown a house in the Lowry Hill neighborhood of Minneapolis, you have been in a Victorian home. Um, a lot of times these are three story homes, right? Where you're getting like an attic level of the house that is actually usable space. Uh, they'll have interesting characteristics to them and shape rooms off the side. I think there's an actual name for this. I just can't think of it. Do you remember what it is? A turret? A turret. Okay, so thank you, Chris. Welcome. This is a turret. She's teaching a class on this in a couple of weeks, believe it or not. Um, but that's with her job as an instructor. So uh, we're helping each other today. That's a win-win. Um, so, hey, guys, if you don't mind, I'd love for you to kind of move in here a little bit. So just so he has, like, flexibility around the table when we're getting parts, uh, supplies, excuse me. Um, okay, decorative trim, lace-like woodwork is um, very common within these houses. We're going to talk about trim at the end of this unit as well. You can identify these by kind of the uh, elaborate detailing and unique, often like Gothic revival elements, right? So it's got like these turrets like they talked about, steeper roofs, a third level, a mixed kind of siding on the front. Sometimes they'll have huge front porches or just a big wraparound porch. Very unique homes. They usually have more living spaces. They usually have like a living room, a dining room, parlor. Very formal spaces as well. That's what Chris is talking about. So living rooms, dining rooms, sometimes they'll have two staircases. Back in the days, it was very common for like rich homes like this. They had servants. So they'd have a separate staircase that went up the back of the house for access to the kitchen, formal sitting area or parlor on the front, very large grand open staircases as well. Okay, um, split levels. So split levels, if you, have, if you have sold a home in St. Louis Park, in Minnetonka, uh, in Bloomington, in Egan, in Savage, anywhere just about 10 minutes on the outskirts of Minneapolis, you have been into a split level. Uh, they're divided into more uh, two or more levels. Um, this particular type is called a bi-level split, right? So you're walking in the door and you've got that Immediate entrance of up or down, half flight of stairs. Not a lot of um, space in the entryway, pretty typically. A four level split is something more like this, three and four level split where you're coming in on the level ground. You, uh, They're oftentimes open concepts. They might have a smaller galley style kitchen that connects directly to the garage. 
And then from there, you will have a split up and down that will go to an upper level, typically bedrooms, and a lower level that is typically bedrooms. Some may or may not have a basement as well. And that's what distinguishes a three level from a four level split. So mixed material exterior, asymmetrical facade, pretty typically have an attached garage. Um, you can recognize them by the staggered floor walls. Contemporary. If you have been showing homes in Linden Hills or any of the luxury areas of Edina, you have been into a contemporary style home. Very clean lines and asymmetrical exterior, large windows, geometrical shapes, um, use of natural and sustainable materials and an open floor plan. Now, just for reference, there are a lot of similarities between contemporary and mid-century modern, but they are not the same thing. And we'll highlight uh, mid-century modern down the line as well. This is a home for sale or that was built in Linden Hills. So this is an actual home in Minnesota where we're seeing asymmetrical roof line, um, very symmetrical window lines. That's an element of Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright construction or design, excuse me, architectural design. That's very common in mid-century modern as well. Um, you know, kind of a blend of woodwork with concrete, strong windows, all of those things. So this is easily identifiable by their unique architectural lines and kind of a modern aesthetic. Tudors. Okay, basically I love every style house. This is why I got into real estate. <laughs> There's not one I don't like. So Tudor style homes, if you have ever sold a home on West or East River Road in Minneapolis or St. Paul, um, or even on Grand Avenue, there are some of these. You have been in a Tudor style home. 15th in France. 15th in France. Okay. 50th in France. All Got it. Uh, I never noticed that. I just noticed the shops. I'll have to look for that next time. Um, so these are identifiable. I think one of the, the biggest characteristics are you have these strong pitch lines on the roof. You have accent timber on them. It's typically timber over a stucco. It has huge fireplaces on it, right? It kind of gives it kind of a mid medieval look to it a little bit. Um, this is like a European design that carried over into the United States. Massive chimneys is one of the distinctive elements of a Tudor home. And if you ever go down West River Road in Minneapolis, you will see a ton of these style homes. They're very spacious as well. Similar in terms of lots of living spaces, just like a um, Victorian style home. So there'll be a lots of formal spaces. Um, they have interesting windows on them. A lot of times they'll have um, kind of custom framework done on the windows, which make them distinctive as well. Has anyone here ever showed a Tudor before? Yeah. yeah. I love the huge fireplaces too, because they're such a design component of a home. Like they're just, they, they create a gathering space. They were used for, for cooking. They were used as a heating source. A lot of times you'll find fireplaces, like the massive fireplaces are because these will connect to bedrooms up the house, right? So back in the day when we didn't have furnace systems, all the bedrooms had fireplaces in them. And so this is, it's like a walk back in history or a walk back in time when you tour some of these properties. It's really cool. Colonial, not my favorite. Um, very popular on the East Coast, okay? Um, we do see some of that here, but there's a couple of different styles that are more like revival styles we see here in the, in the Twin Cities area and in Minnesota. So it's known for its symmetrical facade, center front door, um, salt box. Maybe you've heard that term before, seen it in advertising, salt box style, style house, um, which will have these uh, kind of uniform dormers that come across the front. It's a pretty standard medium pitched roof. Um, oftentimes there's a decorative crown or so here above the front door. Columns are kind of a mark of the entryway. And um, it's very, it's noticeable based on its symmetry and formal appearance. Summit Avenue. Summit Avenue, amen to that. Okay, so here are two actual homes in Minnesota, right? So we have the Colonial Revival, which is like the mini version of this in a way. Anybody toured one of these properties before in Minneapolis or St. Paul? Yeah. Oh, really? Hilarious. And then the Dutch Colonial, which is this gambrel roof. Again, we're going to talk about roofs in, and roof lines in a couple weeks, but that's this style roof right here. It's called a gambrel roof. 
it looks like a barn roof. So when you think gambrel, you're thinking barn roof. Okay. Did everyone here know all of these kind of identifying marks of these style homes already? Or did you learn something yet? I know you did. No, you did not? Okay, awesome. Colin is admitting he did not, which means I have provided value to at least one person in this room today. Love it. Two story. Okay, so two story is the most common style home that we see built anywhere in the country today. It is now becoming uh, become the most common style home in the state of Minnesota. Classic, right? You're getting your two full floors, a living space, typically open concept. Um, you know, there's some varying kind of architectural elements to it, but it's pretty symmetrical. Um, it will include, you know, most often like a central hallway, right when you walk in kind of the front door that leads to living spaces at the back. Um, equal space on both sides of the house is another common element. Um, very common in new construction too. So like this is an actual new construction model, right? Home like a home that a spec home that was built. So we see these all the time. Um, you can recognize it by their height and uniform space. And then obviously it's equal distribution over two levels. Most typically with the basement. It's rare to find a two-story home that does not have a lower level or basement unless you are building with D.R. Horton and it is a detached townhouse. For whatever reason, they don't have basements in Texas, but that is not common here. And I don't think that style is ever going to fly. <clears throat> okay, my absolute favorite, save the best for last, mid-century modern. Heavy influence in Frank Lloyd Wright design. Famous architect, born in Wisconsin. Um, we see his, his work elements everywhere. It's known for uh, flat panes on the windows, geometrical lines, large windows. The goal is to bring the outdoors inside. Um, often kind of minimalistic. If you've seen kind of those wooded fireplaces that have a grill built into them and you have like a sloped asymmetrical roof, those are classic elements of like a mid-century modern design. Um, this is an actual home here in Minnesota as well. So you're seeing a combination of wood and stone being involved in, in um, the exterior design of it. I think it was, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Golden Valley, that's perfect. Yeah, Golden Valley, St. Louis Park, um, Roseville. Burnhill. Yes. Yes, so there's... Hill and Lake Forest in St. Louis Park, Chris was talking about, there's pocket neighborhoods right on the outskirts of the metro. When those were developed in the 50s and 60s, that's where we're, those communities that developed in 50s and 60s is where we see the strongest influence of this style of house. Again, so known for its architecture, simplicity, integration with nature. You will see a lot of elements in these homes that are combining combining elements, right? So you might see metals and you're going to see stonework and you're going to see woodwork and kind of the blending of all of that um, along with maybe simplistic furniture and layout. Here is another one down here. Yeah, isn't that pretty? It's so pretty. So you got a lot of stonework on the outside. You've got these huge flat pane windows. This was, uh, I think this one was actually designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. So just yeah, windows. just windows, so bringing the outside in again, right? Classic element of this architectural design. If you can see inside of the photo here, there's a huge stone wall fireplace, which is one of the like main elements of the inside. So pretty cool. Okay, my sample guys are on duty. Let's talk about flooring. Ceramic tile. So we've got lots of different tiles, right? There's ceramic tile, there's porcelain tile, there's glass tile. I don't have a separate um, outline piece in here. You're going to bring it up to me first, and then I want to show it, and then, and then we'll pass that. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't mean it like that. I'm sorry. I know. There's a lot of information in this, so. Um, okay, so several different types of tile, right? Like we've seen it all when we go into certain homes. Um, this is a ceramic tile. 
Uh, you'll notice it's got a lot of glazing on it. It's made from clay. It's pretty durable. It comes with a lot of patterns. One of the easiest ways to kind of tell it uh, what this type of tile is, is um, based on the glaze level here. So I don't know if you can see that, but it's a thin layer of like a glaze or a print that goes on top of the actual tile, which is the same color otherwise all the way through. That's why if this chips, it has to get replaced because it's not like the tile pattern goes through the entire tile. Um, they're water resistant, long lasting, pretty low maintenance, but they're not really designed to be floor tiles. You ever slipped on one of these while showing a house in the winter? People like to put them in the entryway because they're glazed and they're pretty, but it's the fastest way to go down on a showing in the winter time. So if you're walking in on shiny tile, watch your feet. So identification tips, you're gonna look for solid, often glazed surfaces like this, cooler feel underfoot. Uh, porcelain tile here. You can pass that one around if you don't mind. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, Andy. Thank you, Angie. Andy. We'll call him Andy White for the day. Um, porcelain tile. So characteristics of this, it's a denser type of ceramic, less porous, typically mimics kind of like natural stone. Um, the insulation process is pretty similar. You have a thin set layer that goes in the bottom. There's kind of like this tacking built into the back so it can adhere to that. And then it's grouted between the lines. So there's spacers that are kind of put in play here are in between to make the uniform look when you're installing these. Um, Andy, can you hand me one of the pencil finishes as well? I'm just gonna talk uh, real quick about when you're identifying tile. So here's some key identifiers, right? Um, if you've ever seen kind of like a uh, if you put furniture together before, you have an unfinished edge and a finished edge. That's how you know if tile is done right. This piece is called the bullnose piece. It's designed to go on the end. It's a finished piece, so that edge, which is curved, stands outward. Now, in the event that you don't get an actual bullnose piece for that, what they do is they'll have an, the unfinished edge here on tile will be completed with something called a pencil finish. And that will be a tile look like this that has a specific kind of like an oval-like shape to it. And that is designed to butt up against that unfinished edge and meet the wall and now give you a very finished look on the tile. If you don't have a matching piece to the tile like this, which not all of them will come with it, but most do, um, a lot of times in construction, you will see like a metal frame that's a pencil finish as well. So it's just a, a metal edging that comes in and locks up against that unfinished edge and it gives it a very finished look. It's a way of protecting the tile too because the, the unfinished side is not a sealed edge, whereas the finished side is a sealed edge. So just protecting kind of the integrity of that tile. It's a great way to- A shower. A shower, yeah. Um, a shower would be a, one where you see the kitchens as well, backsplash. If you're gonna do like subway tile, that's like this to have, you know, a formal edge where it kind of meets up with the counters or not counters. Um, yeah, sometimes the counters, but also the cabinets above and just kind of how you cut in that pattern. So look for that because that's, a, that's an example of a tile that's been installed really well, I think. Um, do you want to pass those ones around? Mm -hmm. It's got a pencil finish. Yep. So you can call it a wall trim, a trim, wall trim tile, or a pencil edge, pencil finish. Um, so along with this, their benefits of porcelain tile is that they're very highly water resistant and durable for high traffic areas, and they don't have kind of that slipness. Now you can get a porcelain tile that's glazed, but again, do we wanna use that in snowy winters in an entrance way? Those are things I like to point out to buyers because I guarantee you them or their kids, are, maybe they're going down. And it, it's something that ultimately will probably lead to a replacement and it's not easy to replace tile. Now, another thing about this is if you have a client who's asking you about updates that they could make into their home, either getting it ready to sell or if, if it's a home that doesn't have a lot of updates in it and they're thinking about updates, you can now make recommendations on the type of tile that they could put in certain areas of the home. And this makes you look like the housing expert, right? Because what's the resale value on that when they go to sell? If they're putting money into updating a home, who is it that they're going to talk to when it comes time to get it back on the market? It's the person who knows everything about houses and is providing that value and information. 
Uh, identifying perhaps more uniform in finish and color than ceramic tends to be a little bit heavier and harder. This is a picture of wood grain tile. This has become really popular. Annie, can you grab that big plank right there and just hold that up for everybody to see? So, Joanne, I don't know if you know this. When you see heated floors in a bathroom, is it ceramic or is it porcelain? Uh, most of the time, that's going to be a porcelain tile because it's water resistant. Thank you. So, this is heavy, but this has become really common, right? Like we're seeing these a lot. Um, it is a porcelain style tile, believe it or not. And there's there's another way to tell this when you're looking at it, not necessarily from the, you know, looking down at it, but when you're looking at it in a store and you can teach your clients this, um, for a lot of tiles like this, there is a two-part process where it's actually two, pile, two tiles that are compressed on each other. So this is what's called the homogenous tile. And if you look, you'll see a line that goes kind of right through that where like the tile part that is printed on or textured on the top is now high pressure to the lower part or base of the tile. And we can circulate that around, but it will actually show like a line that goes through it. And then, um, well, I have the, the four designer tiles right there. Those are smaller and can certainly be passed. And they have the same kind of line that goes through it. So the printing process for the tile itself, it's a two-part process. And that's a good indicator of what type of tile it is. So those four on the end there, if we can circulate those so people can see them. The designer tiles, this is a very common pattern now. Yep. Yes. Yeah, it's everywhere now. Um, a lot of times it's in an LVP as well. So, or a luxury vinyl tile, excuse me, not a plank. So it's not always a porcelain tile, but you see how it has that kind of line on it? It's pretty unique. If you don't mind circulating that around, that'd be great. Yeah. I think the biggest difference between ceramic and porcelain is just remember that um, ceramic tile is so often glazed, right? It's just got a shiny, glossy finish to it. Glass tile. Okay, guys. Glass tile is an absolute pain in the rear end to install. Um, this requires special type of installation. If you don't know what you're doing, especially if you're putting this in a shower, um, these tiles are so easy to crack anytime they require cutting. So there's a whole process you have to go through for taping it off and everything else to do cuts and drills through these type of tiles. So um, the reason I'm highlighting this is when you're touring a property with a client, this is a luxury finish. You're doing glass tiles. They're more expensive than a, a porcelain tile and a ceramic tile. They're nice, heavy duty. They oftentimes come with these really beautiful sort of patterns in it. You can see the pattern below with like a high glass or glazed front. There's a smaller version of a glass tile in there as well. Yep. And so um, that one is more common for like a kitchen tile, whereas I would expect to see this probably in a bathroom because it's a little bit larger. So it wouldn't be flooring. This is not flooring. No, nope. this is more common in kind of bathrooms and everything. So uh, translucent. Quality process, as I mentioned, you really have to be careful with that. I did a, uh, when I was representing a builder, I had um, a client basically end up going full custom on a semi-custom home. And we went through uh, two out of every three tiles cracked because the installer did not know what they were doing. And we actually had to sub that out to a specialist who did glass tile. So there, if this is done right and it looks beautifully in a home, you should be highlighting that to your client of how labor intensive it is to do this the right way. And what that does is help establish the value of the, excuse me, a value of the property. Do you want to circulate that one too? And then um, can you bring me a couple of the mosaic tiles or all four of them is fine. The mosaic ones on the end, Andy. Yep, I, I just bring me the whole stack. Thank you. <laughs> So I don't have a part in here on the mosaic tiles, but I'm going to highlight a couple differences really quick of these. Thank you so much. Do you mind if I borrow some space here? Okay. Who knows what kind of tile this is? Love it. Love it. Anybody know what kind of tile this is? 
It's actually it's it's a uh, painted or stained glass tile. So this is the glass tile. Yeah. Yep. How about this? So common in kitchens, right? This is basic. I love it. Yeah. This is a combination of stone and glass throughout. Mosaic tiles are anytime you take misshaped or varying sizes and shapes of tile, and it can be the same, all the same style of tile, or it can be kind of a combination mix of like stone. This is very common to see in homes now. Mm -hmm. They come all kind of attached together on the sheathing, which makes it easier for application on the wall. Um, and then here is another example of mosaic. So all four of those that I'm showing are all mosaic tiles. But this is a combination of glass and it has kind of a wave pattern in there. Okay. Do you? I love it. Yeah. Okay. So trick question. If you know the answer, you can't answer it. Uh, which, which one of these is the most expensive tile? Is it the clay tile, painted glass, glass and stone, or the wave glass? Painted glass. Any guess? Painted glass. Waved? Yeah. So this is actually the cheapest of the tile yeah believe it or not this is the cheapest this is this uh so i can show it for you guys least expensive second most expensive third because of all the little stones and probably the manufacturing process of this this is a combination of stone and glass tiles as well and then the third is this one because it has the waved glass pattern into it um, the painted glass tile, I believe was like $7 a sheet. This was going for like 14, 14 for a 12 by 12. Um, the reason I want to highlight that is now when you're looking at houses, look at a tile and that kind of helps establish the value. Did they put in really cheap tile or are they doing more intricate patterns that might help establish the value? Or they consider more of like a luxury style finish. Penny tiles, super common in bathrooms, right? Mosaic tiles, turn of the century homes. We see these a lot in, in those style bathrooms. Back then, they were literally put in like one tile at a time. Now, at least they come on these backers here, which make the installation process a little easier. So you want to click a little, circulate those around for me so we can... Anybody want to see it? Does anybody want to take a look at any of these tiles? You can put the back on it if you want. Yeah, I like that. Ian, can you bring me the whole bin that has that vinyl and everything in it? Yep, that one. I got a hustle. I got a lot of pages left to go through. Yeah, good luck. Exactly. Okay, uh, real quick. Brief example, um, this is this tile that looks very porous and stone-like. Does anybody know what that is or what that's called? Travertine. That is exactly what it is. It is travertine tile. It's very common to see these in very large slabs in a house. They're, yeah, they're good in kitchens and everything, but I wouldn't recommend them in entrances because they tend to be a little bit more porous. Um, this, do we know what kind of tile that is? That is exactly what it is. Okay, clearly Nicole knows her finishes of homes, right? <laughs> That's exactly what that is. So this is a marble tile, slippery. Again, something I would expect to see maybe in a bathroom. Not recommending that for an entryway at all. Um, this is decorative, but oftentimes they have a, gl a very glossy finish as well. It's a polished finish. So that's what makes it shiny like this. And you can tell it because it's got the veining throughout. Now let's talk about some okay. This here is your classic sheet vinyl flooring, right? So um, not all vinyl flooring is created equal. This is the kind of stuff that we usually see in um, cheap kitchens, bathrooms. It's very common, mud rooms and entryways. It's pretty durable. It's waterproof. Usually goes through like a glue down process in the house. Not a luxury upgrade at all, right? That's why it's not called luxury vinyl. It's just called vinyl flooring. Um, water resistant. It's pretty comfortable. It's a little bit thick, so there's a cushion to it. 
um, but it just goes right on top of the floor. More often than not, they'll put some kind of an underlayment on it, um, but it's easy to take out and it is pretty cheap. So if you're looking for a cheap upgrade, this is what I would expect to see. Now, contrast that with these. Luxury vinyl plank has replaced hardwood, okay? In Minnesota, these products are built to last. They come with typically a 20 year to a lifetime warranty on them. Um, there are certain ways to identify a luxury plank versus a laminate. Um, luxury vinyl plank will come in all sorts of styles in different colors. There will be um, some texture to the top, but it's not going to feel like a really thick floor. Sometimes they have a little bit of give or cushion to them. They go through an easy installation process where it's like click clack. So installing this is pretty easy. They just kind of slide over each other. This is two different ones, but I'm able to, to seam it together like that. Um, the, the joint, I guess is what I would call it, and the lip on that is really what can make a difference when it comes to whether it's water resistant or it's waterproof. The more the little lip on there, the less likely that water is going to get through that seam, right? So you, it's, it kind of curves up like this, if you can see that. So, um, And then they range in thickness from two millimeters up to eight millimeters. So the thicker they are, the more cushion they're going to have. And you'll typically see this style of flooring connect to another style of flooring with the transition strip. You want to just hold that up, Andy, so people can see that. If you don't have these, what can end up happening is, uh, let's say you've got a thicker laminate style floor and you're going from carpet, your toe's gonna catch that edge. Have you ever had that happen to you before? You see real unlevel flooring. So transition strips are designed to kind of connect two types of flooring together. We recommend those as well, because if, it, if you're meeting an LVP or a tile or something with carpet, carpet is glued and stapled down. A transition strip really helps protect that edge from getting cut up. So it's a maintenance factor in a house as well. Um, I can circulate these around. So you... different levels of that too, like different thicknesses and like you said, like different lips and tongue and grooves. And... Yep, all sorts of different styles. The difference between an, an LVP is always designed to be a free floating floor. Okay, so some floors you might go in and you feel like it's really cushy. It could be a little bit thicker plank or they have put an underlayment down. You don't necessarily need an underlayment. There's typically a thin kind of a waterproofing layer that goes between the subfloor and this type of flooring. If it's feeling super cushy, some of the older products have really big kind of cushions built off the back of these. So I'll circulate these around so you can see it and just kind of, you mind passing it on? So we're passing them off. Will you grab me the four planks, please? Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm just going to set them here for now. So I'm going to hold stuff up in a second. Okay, so difference between vinyl, which is engineered, and laminate. More often than not now, if you're going to in a, into a house and it really looks like wood, you can tell it. If it kind of feels more like a wood, it's a laminate flooring. A lot of these luxury laminates are built uh, waterproof now. I would say the majority I would actually call water resistant, not waterproof. If you're looking for true pet proof and waterproof, I'd recommend going with the vinyl. Um, and if your clients are looking for a recommendation on replacing flooring, that's a good one as well. It's easy to install. And most of those products come with a lifetime warranty and are waterproof. So laminate is like glued together particle board, right? So you've got this kind of um, glued board together with like a laminate finish on it. So that just kind of lays and is compressed or glued to the top, which gives it a wood pattern. They have a tendency to be a little thicker. They'll have an underlayment as well. If you're looking for a wood um, a wood finish, I guess, or you want the look of hardwood and not the cost, this is a good product. This is a, an upgrade in a lot of new construction as well. But I would highlight this for when, like, know what these floorings are when you're walking through a property so you can point those little things out to the people that you're talking to. If there is a chip or something that happens in this, most often it does have to be replaced. So just keep that in mind when it comes to um, to floor, like 
homes that might need some work on them. You're looking at individual replacement of this. You don't necessarily have to replace the whole floor, which is nice as well. So that's not the same as end floor. No. No. Nope. Correct. There, you do not refinish laminate floors. So is that the no. laminate that you see here? Um, no. So. Yeah, so there was there was a like I would say the products really started changing around 2010. Prior to that, if you have a house built prior to that, or you've ever walked through and it's a laminate flooring and it's yeah. bubbling all along the seams or it was put in the basement, that's old pergo flooring where it is not waterproof and they're just designed much better now than they ever were before. That's like an old school laminate. They will always continue to wick water if they get wet. That's not a fixable flooring. You'd be looking at replacement, but the new products are much better. So I do highlight that if it's laminate flooring, what's the difference between an old style laminate and a new style laminate that comes um, more built to last or with a, a nice warranty on it? Um, let's see here. Laminate definitely looks more like a wood, okay? That being said, some of the vinyl plank is nice these days, but I'm gonna show you a couple differences. So uh, here's your test in how to know your wood grain. I could not find wood in stock at a single store, okay? They just aren't keeping it now because it's less common in Minnesota. Um, wood expands and contracts. So if you are walking through a house and you see gaps, in natural wood floors, please tell your clients that's a natural occurrence with hardwood. Expansion and contraction, different times of year that wood's gonna have some movement to it. Might sound a little bit more cracky, might see a little bit more gapping. It doesn't mean it was installed wrong or there's a flaw. It could just be cyclical or seasonal, I should say. Nope. Okay. Um, fast quiz on who knows their wood grain. Okay, so this is a, this is a, Laminate flooring. Does anybody know what wood that is? Looks like a Good guess. Huh? Nope. This is hickory. Yeah. Hickory has a lot of straight lining in it. It will have some small knots throughout. Oh, I don't. I shouldn't take out the ceiling. That would be bad. Um, but you'll see, yeah, just some markers of that will be like some small knots, but a lot of straight lining throughout and really detailed color variation, which is super pretty as well. Okay, how about this one? This is a laminate as well. Maple. Yeah, here's a way to tell maple. Maple oftentimes has these really big knots in it, and then it has this intricate kind of a V pattern that goes through the wood. So I want you to know your wood, like when you're talking to clients and you're walking through homes, you can say, oh, this is a wood flooring, right? Cabinets look exactly the same as well. You'll notice the big knots and then kind of this V pattern that goes through some of the veining, okay? Huh? Like V. Yes, V like Victor, V like Victor. Thank you, David. Thank you. <laughs> Some people could have been hearing it as B or something else. So, yeah. Okay. What is this one? Plastic. Plastic. It is oak. Yeah, you're correct. So this is a vinyl plank that's got texture to it. Um, oak is, to me, the most recognizable type of flooring. It has kind of, it has the V patterns. It has a lot of knots. It'll have a combination of big knots and small knots on it as well. A lot of big circle pattern knots too. Oak has quickly become the number one style of flooring that is going in. And we went through this phase where it was like, oh, you want to know a house built in the 90s? Look for the honey oak. Mm -hmm. um, but it is really making a comeback in terms of all sorts of these color variations now. Sorry about that. That's one way to tell kind of what oak is. And then here's the last one. Wild guesses. Most common to see this in a dark flooring. Okay. Walnut. Walnut. Good job, Kelly. Walnut. Walnut has a lot of really straight lining through it. Occasionally, you'll see some of these knots. It's, it's rare to see knots, but they have a very distinct pattern with pattern with very thin lines that kind of go through the wood as well. This is also one of the hardest woods you can get. It is a luxury upgrade in flooring. Super hard wood. Okay, that concludes that part. 
Um, next, we're going to talk about carpet. Thank you. Where's the pose as you're walking? Um, I'm not handy. Okay, so yeah, that was also so brief overview on the carpet, right? Do you know what you're looking at when you're talking about carpet? Um, they're most typically made of nylon, polyester, wool, or triexta, which has become the newest engineered fabric that is like 100% water resistant. Pretty cool stuff. Um, it's replacing a lot of nylon carpets now. Um, it's you know secured with tacking strips and stretched out over flooring. Um, obviously, we know the benefits of it, you know, being warm, et cetera. I like carpet in bedrooms. I don't like carpet in main living areas. Patching is possible depending on the type of carpet, okay? You just have to have someone who's really good at hiding those seams. Okay, so let's talk about a couple of different ways to recognize carpet. Um, is where you're getting these textured carpets. This is considered a luxury carpet. So the pattern is where the loops are kind of reverted back into each other and sewn down. And then the part here that's just like flush is actually a plush carpet. So it's like combining Berber with plush carpet, okay? And it gives you intricate patterns in the uh, in the carpet itself. It's still, it still feels pretty flush, uh, plush as well. My gosh, I'm losing my ability to speak. Uh, pretty plush as well, but um, these are more expensive. And then they come with uh, different variants in their padding. So carpet will always be laid on top of padding if it's done correctly. If you walk on carpet and it feels like the floor is right underneath you, somebody cheaped out, okay? And you wanna highlight that because it's gonna be very uncomfortable for your clients. Um, this is something where you know, like they put in a higher level of finish into the flooring in their house. The uh, One of the most durable kinds of carpet is, uh, also one of the ugliest. Been in a Minneapolis house ever with Berber. I grew up with only Berber carpet, right? Because this is designed to last forever, basically. Berber is a full loop carpet. It is just repeated loop, 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 loop. It is like, think of it like crocheted carpet. It is extremely durable. Um, it's very resistant to traffic. Oftentimes we'll see a really tight loop style Berber carpet in... Um, industrial and commercial settings, like the carpet right below our feet right now is exactly this style of carpet. It is, I don't think there's any um, padding underneath this, but this is designed for high traffic. It's resistant to dirt. It lasts a really long time. It's incredibly durable. That's what Berber is known for, but Berber is also a pain in the butt because since it is a loop after a loop kind of crocheted on the frame, if there's a snag in it, that's what's happening with the carpet, right? And it's not easy. You either, have you ever walked through and seen a Berber carpet where there's just a hole where there used to be carpet and someone had to cut it out? Oh you have to go through a process of almost like re-sewing this into the carpet. If you've ever seen a carpet installer who has like a little, it's like a handheld type sewing machine and we'll just like tack it down. Just come out with your pack of needles. That's David in the back and he's going like this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, Grandma, she can crochet the carpet for you. Or Liz. Liz is really good at crocheting. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. So loop carpets are not good for pets that will scratch. Dogs with, with claws. Um, cats, that's another one where they were just kind of going to dig in through things. Um, Frise carpet is another one I want you to recognize. This is like the 70s version of Shag. It's super cheap. Um, you've got tightly woven strands of carpet here, but they are all cut at all different levels. This carpet is gonna look flat as a pancake in 12 months if you are in a home with kids and it's high traffic area. It looks really nice when it's first installed. It mats down and it's almost impossible to restore. And it looks like a rat's nest. I don't know how else to describe it, right? Like in high traffic areas, this is not a good quality carpet. So if you're going to uh, make any recommendations or identify that. If you're showing a house that has some updates to it, sure, it has new flooring, has the cheapest carpet possible in it, didn't hardly cost them a thing, and this is going to wear out within two years and you're going to replace it. You want to be able to talk to your clients about that. Correct. Just that's builder grade carpet. Everybody says, oh, don't we offer an eight pound pad with our carpet? And oh, okay, well, that's great, except for the fact you're going to have to replace the carpet in two years. And I really did have to replace all my cheap frise in two years. So, 
uh, plush carpet, tightly woven strands, all cut at the same level, tightly compacted. This is your cushiest carpet you can get. This is a high quality carpet. It's great for pets. It's great for kids. It's great for high traffic areas. If you have clients uh, or if you see this in a house, point that out and those facets out to your clients. Really good quality carpet. You can pass that on if you want to. I don't, I don't think there's any way for me to get through all this information today. Do you want to pass out paint samples? Paint. So paint, I have, um, keep this outline so you can kind of look through it on how to identify the finishes. Um, flat paint is your builder grade paint. It's really good at kind of highlighting or hiding imperfections in a wall. So unless you're doing a custom build, most builders will use flat paint. If you go into a home and it is newly painted and they use flat paint, please let your clients know they will either be repainting and repainting and repainting. There's no way to wash that off the walls, just so you know. So if you have kids, tiny little fingerprints, on, you're just going to repaint. I think my builder grade walls have probably 20 layers of paint on them. We repaint it just about every six months until we finally decided we're just going to upgrade to a different finish that's washable. Yes. So if it's flat paint, um, just know that there's going to be some maintenance involved in that for your clients. The higher you kind of come down this line here, I should say, as we kind of progress down the line of finishes, each of these levels of finishes improves on itself in terms of how it reflects light, how durable it is, how washable it is, and how easy it is to maintain. Okay. Um, gloss paint or high gloss paint right here at the bottom. This is an enamel level gloss, right? This is the kind you want in your kitchens and in your bathrooms. If you've ever seen a wood grain cabinet, like uh, if you order white cabinets or in your, you're in a kitchen that's a white cabinet and it's just kind of glossy, but you can't see any wood grain in the door, that is probably a high gloss enamel paint, super easy to clean, great for maintenance, perfect for kitchens and baths. If I see high gloss paint in... In a kitchen I'm showing, I'm pointing out that that's an enameled cabinet. It's just a higher level of paint. It's going to be much easier for them to maintain a white cabinet than maybe a white cabinet that's painted in an eggshell finish. Definitely not a flat finish, right? You're not scrubbing those cabinets clean. It's going to be the grubbiest kitchen you've ever seen in six months. So um, these are some just little detailed tips you can point out when you're with clients on showings. Okay, countertops. This is a big one. Laminate countertops are just particle board with like a plastic layer over the top. I'll let you just start passing those out, okay? Um, they are the most cost effective. There's a lot of patterns and things associated with it. They're difficult to repair. They can come unglued on the edge. We've probably all seen a home that has an edge like this before. Cheap to install, not going to last long. It's not heat resistant. You put a hot pan on it, it's going to burn. It can scratch and it can chip. Now the counterpoint to that is a high resolution laminate, which is a little bit better. Um, that is going to be a pressed and sealed surface. So I call that a laminate that functions more like a granite. You can put hot pans on it. You still wanna be careful, but that, deep, that sealed surface makes it a little bit better quality for heat protection. It's also really hard to cut through that surface. So, so so in a high resolution laminate, you're going to see it has kind of this glossy finish to it. And it has like a pressed glossy finish look where most laminates just have kind of a smooth, smooth glossy look to it versus this, which has kind of a textured look to it. Yeah. Corian would be kind of like the next level up. If you've seen a cabinet like this before, this is a um, solid surface uh, resin type cabinet. It can come in a variety of different edges and styles. It's designed to look more like stone. Hey guys, I wanna get through this. If we can just calm down for a few minutes, that'd be great. Granite um, is pretty popular now. It has a great appearance. It comes in a wide variety of colors. It's heat resistant. There is maintenance though, because it does require periodic sealing. So in this outline that you get to keep, you're going to see we're going from kind of like basic grade or good grade and progressively building on that to the higher level of finishes. When you're out with your clients, point out these things that help establish value or point out these things that will become, maybe come with repair um, if we know how our clients are going to be using the house. 
or how to identify whether or not there's an imperfection in it. If it's something that's gonna require replacement, we wanna let them know as well. And we don't have to use scare tactics. The more information that we have, the better we can communicate with our clients. Quartz is another one. Um, most people will ask, well, what's the difference between quartz and, and marble and granite? And how can you tell the difference? Quartz pretty typically has a flecking pattern in it. It looks like a lot of dots together. And um, thank you. Granite will sometimes look like that too, believe it or not, that's granite. It tends to be a little thicker slab on granite as well. Um, that's granite. Quartz yeah. has... Quartz has a unique kind of combination of flecking, which is pretty consistent, and then some veining through it. And one of the differences, I guess, marble and quartz, I would kind of consider like cousin stones. Um, marble has a lot more veining that's prominent versus quartz, which is going to have more of kind of that flecking, almost uh, freckled pattern to it. We're running way behind schedule. I'm probably not going to get to all this. I think I'm going to finish a cabinetry. And then I'll see how I can incorporate the rest um, maybe on our follow-up training next week because I'll have less to talk about next week. I want to go over these quick styles of doors just so you can understand the difference. So a slab cabinet is just going to be flat. We're seeing this in a lot of contemporary and modern style kitchens now. It's also really common in mid-century modern homes. This is shaker cabinets. You've probably seen these in just about every other house that you've toured right now. A shaker cabinet looks like a recessed panel. It's very square and symmetrical looking. This is a maple wood shaker cabinet. I'm pretty sure I have this exact cabinet in my kitchen right now. Quick hint, if you put in natural woodwork in your kitchen or your client does it, it is going to turn yellow over time. Natural wood progressively gets more and more yellow depending on its exposure to light. So just keep that in mind, it might require refinishing. This is what you would call like a decorative panel insert. Um, or recessed decorative panel. So you can get very elaborate with some of these designs and cabinets. This would be an upgrade and more on the higher end finishing if it's a decorative panel. This is a raised panel. So we've probably all seen these. They're, they're very common in like 90s kitchens. Sometimes they'll have an archway on them. And um, this center portion here really stands out as level with the framework, I guess, of the cabinet. These are not a cheap cabinet either. Does anybody know what the finish is called on this? There's an actual term for it. Nope, so this is a recessed panel cabinet and you can tell recess because it's shaped like a shaker, but it has this like quarter bead framework that kind of builds around it. This particular style is called chocolate glazing, okay? So it gives it like an antique finish where it's just an edging done. This is a luxury upgrade. It is very expensive. If you see this in homes, point that out to your clients. Chocolate glazing. Yep. And then glass cabinets, which we see pretty commonly um, in upper level cabinetry. Oftentimes they have some kind of track lighting or recessed lighting in them. It's a great way to kind of showcase the mini bar or um, show your fine china and dishes through the cabinets. Okay, I'm going to have to cut it there, guys. There was a lot of information in this one. We probably could have done two parts. I have samples here in the office. If you come in, you're welcome to look through these. If you have follow-up questions, reach out to your sales coordinators. who will all have copies of the outline as well. And then I will try and piggyback off of this next week where I can use this same part and kind of build into the mechanical systems, which will take less time overall to talk about. So... My hope is that you walked away with at least one or two things from this that you didn't know before. And can, what'd you say? Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. That makes me feel valued. Chris said she's stealing it and she's a teacher. So I appreciate that. Okay. Thank you guys for joining and we'll see everybody later. Have a great day. Bye. Did you stop recording? You done?